this time I'm going to be talking about machine reading with uh, neural networks. And this is a very uh, extensive topic and also a very popular topic. So I'm, uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover here and I probably won't be able to get through uh, absolutely all of the topics on this, but I'm going to try to aim for a high level overview. So what is machine reading? Um, so machine reading is reading a passage and then trying to answer questions about that passage. Um, so we've talked about, uh, you know, knowledge-based question answering and semantic parsing and other things like this. And in these cases, the, um, the source of information with which you would like to answer queries is, um, uh, is like a knowledge base. Um, so in contrast to knowledge-based QA, you need to synthesize the information in the passage as well. So in a way, the passage is the knowledge base uh, in itself. So this is difficult, of course, because, you know, as opposed to just looking things up in a structured uh, knowledge base where you can execute a query like SQL or uh, Sparkle or Sparkle or something like this, um, you, need to, uh, you need to directly extract information from this unstructured uh, source. So, um, Machine reading tasks, there's many different uh, types of machine reading uh, tasks or specifically machine reading plus question answering formats. Um, and these can be multiple choice questions. Uh, they can be span selection uh, type uh, questions, closed questions. And also, um, I kind of view information extraction as a type of reading comprehension as well, or machine reading. Um, so in information extraction, like we talked about last class, where we're trying to extract the information to put in a knowledge base from text, you still are, have to read the passage and understand it in order to you know, extract information effectively. Um, but it's not with respect to a specific question that, you're, uh, that you have at hand. So what I'll be talking about this time is mostly uh, machine reading plus question answering tasks where we're reading with the specific goal of answering a question. So before I go into specific models and methods, I'd like to go through some of the tasks that are out there at first. Um, so multiple choice question answering tasks um, can look a little bit like this. I think most people in this class are familiar with these te uh, tests because you've taken them, uh, you know, at the very least uh, when you were doing entrance exams for, uh, um, you know, uh, CMU or whatever other schools you went to. But also, you know, you're doing this in the quizzes for this class itself. So you're given a reading, you need to read through the reading and then answer multiple choice questions about it. So this uh, MC test data set is 500 passages, 2,000 questions about simple stories. Um, and you can kind of see these here. And recently in 2017, um, Ly et uh, here at CMU introduced another data set called RACE that has 28,000 passages, 100,000 questions from actual English comprehension tests uh, done by uh, students learning English in China. So in addition to this, there's also span selection tasks. So span selection tasks, the most famous uh, variety of this is squad. Um, this has 500 passages and 100,000 questions on Wikipedia text. And they look a little bit like this. It's in meteorology precipitation is any product of the condensation of the atmosphere water, atmospheric water vapor that falls under gravity. And um, then you uh, have a question like what causes precipitation to fall, gravity, and you need to select the span within the passage that corresponds to the correct answer here. Um, there's also uh, quite a few other examples. Um, uh, another example of this would be Trivia QA, uh, which has 95K questions, 650K uh, evidence documents. So this is kind of a um, uh, larger scale and broader uh, version of this span selection question. Another example is closed questions. So closed questions 
Um, uh, one example of this is the CNN Daily Mail dataset. This was created from summaries of articles where you have to guess the entity. So for example, if you have the context, um, that's the BBC producer allegedly struck by Jeremy Clarkson will not press charges against the top tier host. Da, 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 da. And it says uh, producer X will not press charges against Jeremy uh, Clarkson. Um, and then uh, the answer is Oisin Timon, which is mentioned here uh, as well. Um, so basically, um, that means you need to fill in the X with, uh, with the correct answer. Um, they, in this data set, they also did some uh, anonymization. So basically, uh, to make it so it wasn't too easy to answer the question by just having a big uh, language model, so you actually have to comprehend the passage and, and get it right, they replaced all entities with like ent381, ent212, ent153, etc. Um, so this makes it so that you can't just memorize facts inside a big uh, model and you actually have to read the passage in order to get the answer correct. So these are some examples of uh, like formats of machine reading tasks. Um, so I, I think uh, this is an interesting subject, obviously, because you know, in order to do this well, you really have to have uh, a strong ability to process language correctly. Um, of course, you need all the kinds of things that we've talked about so far. So like a grasp of syntax, uh, a grasp of some variety of sem semantics, et cetera. Um, but in particular for machine learning models, there's a couple things that become uh, machine reading models, there's a couple things that become important. So um, for example, uh, because we must take a large amount of information and extract only the salient parts, uh, we need uh, some sort of attention over the, uh, the appropriate parts of the document. And in addition, um, very often you must perform some sort of reasoning about the information that you've extracted and you need to pull parts from different parts of the document in order to, uh, in order to answer questions effectively. So this also includes multi-step or multi-hop reasoning. So I'll be talking about these, uh, these kind of in turn. Um, before I go into this though, I, I should give a caveat about data sets. So one of the difficult things about machine reading or question answering in general is that it's very, it's a very attractive field and kind of conceptually interesting. But on the other hand, um, there aren't large kind of naturally occurring public data sets that can be easily processed into things that you can run a benchmark on. So this is something like in contrast to, um, you know, machine translation or something like that, where there are data sets that you can just go and crawl and use for evaluation. So because of this, um, a lot of people will go and make data sets uh, in, in some way to try to, uh, to try to do this, but, um, uh, you need to be very careful about how the data set was made. And there's a lot of research on this. So no matter what the task is, data bias matters. Um, so you have domain bias, uh, simplifications of underlying assumptions. So obviously, if you choose a multiple choice data set to use, you should only be able to answer multiple choice questions. And you wouldn't be able to answer freeform questions, uh, for example. Um, and like, as I said, uh, for reading comprehension or machine reading, real uh, large scale copyright free databases are hard to come by. Um, and many of the data sets created from some sort of weak supervision or crowdsourcing have not been vetted uh, very well. So um, I, I don't mean to pick on these data sets. I think they all serve a purpose, but it's important to be you know, familiar with the, uh, both the good parts about them and the bad parts about them or the, you know, the things you should be paying attention to. So for one example, from a very early setup in um, kind of these machine reading tasks, it's the baby data set. And this uh, was automatically generated synthetic te text aimed at evaluating whether a model can learn certain characteristics of language. So 
For an example, Mary went to the bathroom, John moved to the hallway, Mary traveled to the office, where is Mary? And the answer is the office. Um, you also have two supporting facts. So like John is in the playground, John picked up the football, Bob went to the kitchen. Uh, and then you have the answer, the question, where is the football? And it's in the playground because you know John is in the playground and you picked up the football. Um, so these are kind of, uh, you know, designed to be simple, but still test uh, the abilities of models to answer certain uh, common types of questions. Um, however, you know, this is not real language. It's synthetically generated, right? And um, in the past, papers would evaluate only on this extremely simplified data set and then make claims about the learn ability to learn language that obviously wouldn't handle, um, uh, you know, scale to real language data sets. Another example of this is an examination of the CNN Daily Mail uh, data set. So um, even the synthetically created real data sets have problems. So um, an analysis of the CNN Daily Mail data set revealed very few sentences required actual multi-sense reasoning, um, or on the other hand, could be too difficult due to anonymization or wrong pre-processing. So this was a very interesting work that basically went in and found, you know, how many of them you can uh, solve, uh, you can solve exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, 13% were exact match, kind of easy ones. 41% were, uh, you know, uh, paraphrasing type things. Um, but only 2% uh, required multiple sentences. And on the other hand, 8% uh, uh, were due to co-reference errors in the original pre-processing of the data uh, when they uh, tried to anonymize entities, et cetera. So um, uh, you could see that almost 25% of these were just not answerable, and only 2% were um, you know, kind of the really interesting hard examples. Another interesting paper in this uh, regard was adversarial examples in machine reading. So basically um, what this method did was it added a sentence or word string specifically designed to distract the model and it could drop the accuracy of state-of-the-art models from 81 to 46%. So basically um, what they did was they uh, took the, uh, the question um, at added in some kind of fake uh, like entities or dates into the question and then added this, uh, converted this into a statement and then added this to the end of the, um, uh, the end of the statement in squad, sorry, end of the passage in squad and demonstrated that this dropped uh, the accuracy of state of the art models significantly. So this kind of demonstrates, you know, what city did Tesla move to in 1880? Obviously, Tadakatsu moved to the city of Chicago in 1881 is not an answer to what city did Tesla move to in 1880. And this still throws the model off, which shows that it's not really you know, deeply understanding the passage, but rather just looking for kind of surface level cues. Um, another uh, thing that people have looked at is adversarial creation of new data sets. So the idea is to create data sets that current models do poorly on, but humans do well. So the process is to generate potential, um, uh, like, create questions. Sorry, I, um, I skipped one part. So you create questions uh, through crowdsourcing or whatever other method. Uh, generate potential answers uh, from a, a current baseline model. Um, find the ones that the uh, QA model uh, does poorly on and have humans filter, filter for natural. <laughs> <Excuse me. clears throat> Sorry. Um, so basically what this does is this um, creates, uh, you know, questions that um, the current models fail on, but humans nonetheless uh, view as natural. Um, however, if you look at some of the data sets, adversarial examples can be artificially hard or noisy and not representative of the actual questions that you would get. So um, 
in contrast, uh, there's, for example, a data set called Natural Questions, which takes the opposite approach. Um, it creates questions um, uh, naturally from search logs and uh, then uses crowd workers to actually answer the questions. So instead of creating artificial questions, it's taking natural questions and creating the answers from them. So um, this was created by Google and you know, Google obviously gets lots of search, search queries. So they have access to these questions, um, which is useful. Um, sorry, I got a, a question and I'll, I'll handle that in a second after I finish with this. So um, what color was John uh, Wilkes Booth's hair? Um, then they find the Wikipedia page and um, then they find the evidence of it and get jet black. Um, and uh, then there's other examples of like Boolean questions um, and other examples of questions that have no answer where you cannot find like justification for that answer in, um, in the passage. So I think in general, if you want to find a good data set that you can really trust, um, this goes not only for machine reading, but also any other thing where you need to um, find data I generally trust data sets much more if the inputs are naturally occurring or naturally created and you have to do crowdsourcing to find the outputs rather than vice versa. So in many of the QA data sets, you know, they're creating the inputs to the actual model and in those cases, you know, they can be uh, ripe with artifacts, uh, etc. So going to the uh, going to the question, um, instead of having humans filter, would it be possible to filter the data using cross entropy to remove noisy examples? Um, that that's a good question. Um, I, I think you could potentially take a language model and try to filter the data, um, but if you're creating a test data set, I think it's really useful to have a human look at it. So I, I would suggest actually having a human check on the on the data as well because your model just might not be you know might not be good even humans are not perfect at this task so you can get a uh, unnatural things uh, here anyway but i think humans would be better than lms um cool um so now that i've talked a little bit about data sets and the caveats of the data sets I'd like to move into actual models. So um, attention models for machine reading. Um, basically, the idea here is that you want to identify the most likely supporting evidence in the passage. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is pre-trained um, pre models or things like this. And the reason why I'm not going to talk about pre-trained models is that most of the competitive uh, models nowadays use pre-trained models to calculate their embeddings regardless of the underlying architecture they're doing. So um, one thing that you should know is that for any of the models, any of the kind of QA or attention-based models that I'm presenting here, you should assume that you will need to have a strong pre-trained model like BERT, Roberta, whatever, uh, underlying uh, the model that you use. Um, so given that, now to talk a little bit about exactly how the models uh, may work. Um, so basically one thing that, uh, one model that you can do is encode the document and the question and try to generate an answer. So basically the idea is um, you take the document and the question, you encode them together, and then you do a prediction and try to create an answer. Um, so the, problem with uh, a model like this is if you encode uh, the documents independent of the questions, then um, this can be hard. So like this, you know, it can also be it, like, also, if you think about it from a human point of view, it's definitely harder for a human to, you know, read a document and remember all the content and really internalize it and then be able to answer questions about it than if they read the questions first and then skim the document for, uh, for the answers. So this is kind of the, the former of those two choices. And obviously this is hard, you know, both for humans and for models. So another alternative to this, um, or some alternatives to this are as follows. 
so the this um, attentive reader, which was one of the first um, kind of popular neural models in this paradigm, um, reads the query first and then attends to the values um, in the context. So you basically have the query, um, you, uh, you calculate a, a vector for the query using a LSTM or transformer or whatever, and then you perform attention over the values uh, over the vectors in the um, in the context or in the passage, and then uh, combine both of these together to try to answer the question. So the good thing about this is when you do the this attention here, then you can focus on the um, on the query itself. The bad thing about this is that the query is not considered during encoding. So essentially, you have to encode the document before knowing the query. And you can't uh, you can't focus on um, the relevant parts, for example. So there's another method that they call the impatient reader, which basically rereads the document every time you get a new query token and update your understanding. Um, so they had a um, basically every every time uh, you get a new token in the query you will do attention over the, uh, the document and update the hidden state here. So you do that for the first uh, word in the query, the second word in the query, and the third word in the query, et cetera. So um, as I said, these were kind of early attempts. Um, so instead of, uh, for specifically span selection style question answering tasks, there's other things you can do as well. So span selection, as I said, you just have to select the span that is most relevant to, um, to the query uh, that you are focusing on. Um, and so when you do this, basically how much attention you're paying to that span is a very strong ind indication of this, right? So basically the way that this model works is the score of the entity or the score uh, of the span or whatever that you're interested in is the sum of the attention scores over all mentions of this particular entity. So like if we have um, uh, Obama and Putin said Obama in Prague, the score of the entity Obama would be the sum of all of the attention values over this. And then you might use this to uh, fill in this, uh, this XXX in the question here. So this could be, this is particularly useful for uh, query uh, for closed style questions. Um, so I, I got a question, which is for the impatient reader, is it just attention over the encoded hidden states changing? or the hidden states themselves changing with each new query token as well. So um, the, the way this works is basically it does attention. Um, the hidden states themselves are not changing. It's basically doing attention over these and, um, and feeding in this uh, first query token into a RNN. And then it's uh, moving to the next query token. It's again doing attention um and uh and feeding in the the query token and updating the rnn so uh the actual encoding of the document is not changing either um so another method this is kind of uh an interesting uh method of attention over attention so um, we want to know the document words that match best with the most important words in the query. So they have attention in both directions. They have attention in the, over the query and they have attention over the document. And so basically here, what we have is what document words match each query word. So um, the, uh, for each query word, we have attention over the document words. And then we also have which words in the query seem important for the document on average. So they basically do attention over each of the words in the query. 
you take the average of all of these attention values. And so if there's a particular word in the query that seems really important, um, then you upweight the, the score of that. And then you take the dot product of these two to get um, basically a score for each, uh, um, for each entity in the, uh, in the document or each word in the document. And then use that as your, um, as your overall score. So um, finally, there's a, um, uh, a method called bidirectional attention flow, which basically calculates um, the document to context and context to document attention. Are, are transformers involved in these works? So you, you can definitely um, use any of these methods with, uh, with underlying representations from transformers, et cetera. I think most of uh, many of these uh, were first devised for like LSTM based models and then went transformer based, uh, you know, um, uh, like pre trained re representations came out, then they were uh, applied. Uh, basically, the underlying representation was switched into being something like a transformer. Um, so finally, finally bidirectional attention flow, um, it, what you can do is you can calculate document to context and context to document attention. Um, both of the representations are concatenated to word uh, representations themselves or um, uh, you know, contextualized representations themselves. And, um, uh, and then you use this to make the final uh, determination of the um, of the scores. So here, this is uh, largely used in um, uh, span selection based methods. So, or, you know, was devised for span selection based methods. And the way it works is you have the query, you have the, uh, the context, and then you do query to context attention and context to query attention. So um, that's like what I talked about before. So you do attention over um, either the uh, either the context or the query, and then you uh, you feed in all of the representations from these in addition to the original uh, representation, and then finally you try to predict the start and the end of the span. So. Um, these are just some examples of the models that people have used to attend between the query and the context. Um, so another thing is if you're talking specifically about span extraction based methods, which are, you know, a very common variety of methods, especially given the popularity of squad and other similar benchmarks. Um, uh, there's also a question of how you can choose uh, answer spans. And um, in span-based models, we need to choose a multi-word span uh, that we're going to be returning as our answer. Um, so, you know, our answer could be gravity, or it could be grapple, or it could be within a cloud, which is three words. And um, Single word machine reading models uh, choose a single word or entity. Um, other models uh, such as NER might choose spans, but they'll choose multiple spans within a document. So the difference here is that we want to choose a single span. So um, one easy way to do it is like the, the BIDAF model that I talked about before. So, you know, you just make a prediction on the left span and you make a prediction on the right span. Um, and then you take uh, whatever the, the highest scoring uh, values for each of those are. Um, there's also something like a dynamic span decoder, which can um, uh, refine the left and right boundaries. So you first pick the left span, then you pick the right span, then you pick the left span, uh, etc. Um, so this is very, uh, I went very briefly through the, um, the modeling part. I, I think there's lots of different um, 
uh, models that you could use for this uh, span kind of span selection thing. But honestly, um, a lot of them are kind of variations on the general theme of wanting to have attention over long documents and use this attention to calculate good representations and then use them to make uh, to make predictions. Um, perhaps a more interesting or unique uh, issue that we encounter in doing machine reading is the fact that we need to synthesize information from multiple pl places in the document to make predictions. Um, so to give an example, um, after making our initial pass looking at the document, it might become clear that more information is necessary. So uh, to give the previous example that I showed, we could have John went to the hallway, John put down the football, uh, where is the football? So what you would do first is you would look at the question, attend to football, and then realize that um, uh, you could then attend to John. And you would see that um, now uh, after you attend to John, you can find uh, John went to the hallway and use this to answer the question. So um, to give some examples, um, so like even in the examples that I showed before, you know, like SWAT or CNN Daily Mail, in some cases you do definitely need um, multiple steps of reasoning in order to answer the question effectively. Um, there are some data sets that have been explicitly created to require multiple steps through text. Um, and they're often labeled with supporting facts that demonstrate that multiple steps are necessary. So an example of this is Hot Pot QA. Um, and basically, uh, the way this works is you have uh, multiple paragraphs, um, often from different documents. Um, and the question is, what was the former band of the member of Mother Love Bone who died just before the release of Apple? So in order to find this, um, this has seven uh, supporting facts. So um, uh, you have Mother B Love Bone was an American rock band. Um, Frontman Andrew Wood. So you have uh, Andrew Wood here. Um, you can see that Wood died uh, days before the release of Apple. And then if you go to um, uh, this other paragraph, you get Andrew Wood and then the rock band uh, malfunction. So you can see that you kind of have to synthesize together information from lots of different places in order to be able to answer this uh, reliably. Um, or you might think, um, it, actually some analysis of this data set has shown that it has its own biases as well and there might be surface level cues that would allow you to uh, answer these questions without doing multi-hop reasoning. But nonetheless, um, I think there are a fairly large number of questions in this data set that do, uh, in fact, require uh, co covering multiple hops. But uh, if you want to read more about it, you can read this paper by Chen and Jarrett. So now, what about architectures for multiple, uh, for multiple hop reasoning? So, one way you can potentially solve this problem is, uh, is just by using a very, very deep neural network. So if you think about it, you know, the first layer of your neural network, especially if you're using something like a transformer, um, could attend to the appropriate place, and the second layer could attend to a different place, third layer could attend to a different place, et cetera. Um, I think this definitely, you know, is a way to solve uh, some varieties of problems and actually, you know, very deep transformers have proven uh, pretty useful or powerful without, um, without explicit methods to handle multiple step reasoning. Um, however, there are definitely um, gains that can be gotten uh, from coming up with architectures that are specifically uh, tailored for this, and I'd like to give a few examples of such architectures. 
So memory networks are a general formulation of models that access external memory through attention. Um, and this paper also gives a specific instantiation for document level QA. Um, and in the, the basic idea is um, you have, sorry, actually, um, yeah, so sorry, th this is a little bit, it would have been nice to have a, a figure here. I, I, uh, I realize the figure is not until the next slide, but basically what you do is you have a memory bank where the memory bank is essentially a large set of vectors that um, that can contain um, uh, memory that you can use for uh, for later tasks. And the way this works is essentially you do attention over the uh, over the memory bank and try to get the first memory value here. Um, and then um, you can get a second element from the memory conditioned on the first and, um, and et cetera, et cetera, or th that's what this paper does anyway, sorry. Um, and then use both to get the answer like this. So basically what this does is this sets up a larger bank of, uh, of memory that you can use to remember uh, items about the, uh, um, the document or something, et cetera. But I, I think maybe it, with the figure, um, it will become more clear. So essentially what you do is you have this big um, uh, memory bank where you put in, uh, where you can either put in or take out uh, vectors from them. And uh, you then do soft attention over the memory bank, take the weighted sum of this, and, um, and then take, use that weighted sum to do the next set of attention over this memory bank, et cetera. Um, and there's lots and lots of um, examples of uh, how to use these. Uh, some examples can simply be, um, uh, attending to a fixed memory that is learned at training. Other examples can go in and actually update the memory values as you gradually process the document, uh, etc. So um, all in all, this is essentially a way to expand the, um, uh, you know, the amount of capacity that the, the neural network hidden state can have. Uh, I think that might be another good interpretation. It's a way to expand the capacity that a neural network hidden state can have and kind of update uh, specific parts of the hidden state while not touching other parts of the hidden state and then accessing the appropriate parts when you want to finally um, like answer questions. So that would be another way to think about this. Um, so in the... Um, Original paper on memory networks, basically what they did was sing um, two steps of this kind of memory access uh, that can be used to do uh, reasoning. So they have their step one here and step two here. Um, this uh, example here had three steps of memory access. Um, but then another question could be, when do you want to stop uh, doing these memory accesses and say, okay, we're, uh, we're okay, we're done and ready to answer our question. And like, as I said, you can uh, do a fixed number of steps uh, through you know, memory access or reasoning. Um, in other cases, there are, uh, you can attend to a stop reasoning uh, symbol um, or have a explicit stop reasoning predictor where the stop reasoning predictor is trained using something like uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so, so basically you can either do it in a fixed way or in a dynamic way where you have a dynamic number of steps uh, that is trained uh, in, in some fashion. Um, I'm talking about this specifically within the um, within the context of multi-hop reasoning. But 
you could also, like, as I said, you know, one way to do multi-hop reasoning is by just having a very deep uh, model, you know, a transformer model or LSTM model or whatever. Um, and there's also analogs, which I, I guess I don't have in the references uh, to this uh, within those. So for example, there are papers on uh, transformer models that you can train to um, use only a few of the layers for easier problems and uh, more layers for harder problems. So if people are interested in those, I can, um, I can provide references to these as well. Okay, are there any questions about that so far? Okay. So, um, one important thing um, with kind of machine reading uh, models is that very often the answer, um, very often the answer can be, you know, anywhere in an extremely large body of text. So um, an interesting example of this is that you can, um, you might want to do question answering over all of Wikipedia. So you get a question and you would want to uh, use any page in Wikipedia to be able to answer that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that's not feasible. We can't run, um, especially, you know, at the time of answering the question, you can't run BERT over absolutely all of Wikipedia um, with your, uh, you know, new models. So what we can do instead is um, first decide which sentences to cover and then do, uh, you know, kind of a large, stronger reasoning step over these uh, sentences. So um, basically the idea here is you have the query and you have a document or a set of documents. You do sentence selection where the selected sentences are kind of a latent variable. And then you have the document summary and then given this document summary, you do answer uh, generation. Um, so the idea being that you just subselect all of the necessary evidence and then try to reason over that necessary evidence. Um, you could kind of view this also as a variety of multi-hop reasoning because you're basically um, identifying, doing a single hop to identify the, what you want uh, to be reading in the first place and then doing um, one or more hops after that. Um, there's also methods for uh, retrieval plus QA. So um, uh, there's a, a famous uh, paper on Dr. QA, which is basically a retrieval plus QA model uh, where you re first retrieve sentences from Wikipedia and then you uh, do reasoning over those sen sentences to answer them. So, a recent and interesting development in this direction is to do retrieval plus language modeling as a, uh, a way to, um, uh, as a way to do question answering. And before I talk about this, I think it would be good to talk about how language models can be used to do question answering in the first place. So um, if we have, a uh, Dante was born in blank um, as a question. So, um, or like you want to know where Dante was born. Um, you feed Dante was born in mask to a masked language model. And like Elmo or Bert or whatever masked language model you want would then predict the word that appears in the mask. And it could potentially um, answer this question. And there's a nice paper called Language Models as Knowledge Bases, question mark, um, that attempts to answer these queries in this way. Um, but the problem is that language models, you know, they have a limited number of parameters. Um, you know, and if you actually calculate um, the amount of information that you would expect to be included in all of Wikipedia, and you calculate the amount of information that you think you could um, uh, store in language model parameters based on how many bits they have, you can tell that BERT is you know, not large enough to store all of the information that you would expect to have in Wikipedia. I actually did 
kind of back of the envelope calculations uh, about this uh, using uh, the entropy of Wikipedia and information theory, uh, theoretic type measures and stuff like this. So BERT is probably not large enough to memorize all of Wikipedia. Um, so because of this, you know, that kind of lends credence to the necessity to do, um, you know, kind of a lookup uh, step before you do this. And of course, you know, this is completely analogous to humans, right? We don't know all the answers off the top of our head. We need to search for, for things. Um, so based on this, um, there's kind of a combination of this multi-hop uh, reasoning approach, uh, sorry, um, uh, retrieve and answer reasoning approach with language models. And it's, um, it, it's a recent paper that came out called Realm, where basically what they do is they have the question, which is the blank at the top of the pyramid is the question they want to answer. And um, then they have a, a retriever that basically retrieves documents that they think are relevant or retrieves passages that they think are relevant. Then they concatenate the query and the document. And then they try to solve this mask language modeling objective like we have at the top. So basically the, the idea is that it is much, much easier to solve this mask language modeling prediction problem um, if you have supporting evidence that is also included um, in the passage there. So I think this is an interesting idea and they went through a lot of work to, you know, be able to train this entire model uh, from end to end. So I, I think this is a, a nice paper that you might want to read if you're interested in this. Okay. So another um, interesting feature of multi-hop reasoning that a couple papers have examined recently is that in many multi-hop questions, it's possible to split these multi-hop questions into, into uh, multiple kind of single hop or simplified questions. So um, the example I'm showing on the right here is from a data set called uh, the break data set where basically they uh, took natural language questions over a number of different information sources and decomposed them using crowdsourcing into uh, simplified versions of the questions. So for example, if we have returned the keywords, which have been contained by more than 100 ACL papers, um, we have papers, um, uh, so this is the one on the very right, we have papers, this is the first thing, and then we have papers in ACL, so that's our condition. So uh, we have number one in ACL. Then we have keywords of number two, uh, number of number two for each number three, so number of papers in ACL for, uh, for each type of keyword. Um, and then number three, where number four is more than 100. So um, you can see that this is kind of like, answering individual uh, questions. And so if you find all of the papers, um, then you could then find all of the papers in ACL, then you could find all of the papers in ACL with, um, uh, or all of the keywords of all of the papers in ACL, et cetera. So uh, you can see how uh, this allows you to gradually um, uh, build up to the final more difficult question. Um, there's also a nice work by Minidal, 2019, that uses um, rules to decompose questions and actually uh, demonstrates the utility of this on, uh, on multi-hop question answering data sets. So this is Slightly, this is a slightly different variety uh, compared to what I was talking about before. So up until now, I was talking about single questions that inherently require multi-hop reasoning. But another thing that you can think of, like let's say you're using your phone to try to gather information about some, you know, some event or uh, entity that's of interest to you. Um, in this case, you might um, you might gradually like request more information about the same topic. So, 
uh, to give an example, if we have what, what is the origin of Daffy Duck, um, and the teacher answers, you know, Daffy Duck first appeared in Porky's Duck Hunt. And then the student asks, uh, what was he like in that episode? Uh, then the teacher could give an answer to that. Um, was he the star? That would also mean the star of the episode. So, you know, um, what you can see is that all, all of the second and third questions are kind of reliant on the first question, right? So um, it's not explicitly multi-hop within a single question, but on the whole, you need to be uh, aware of the answer to the previous question. So I think this is uh, both interesting and very relevant for, you know, like personal assistance or something like that. Okay, so um, that's all I have on multi-hop uh, reasoning, multi-step reasoning uh, methods. Uh, are there any questions there? Okay, um, if not, I will continue on. So um, fi finally, I'd like to talk about symbolic reasoning uh, plus neural nets specifically from the point of view, uh, mostly from the point of view of machine reading. Um, and what I mean by symbolic reasoning is basically, you know, things for which we can write logical formulas or arithmetic uh, uh, operations, et cetera. And um, reasoning about um, uh, reasoning about symbolic representations is something that actually actually um, we don't need machine learning or um, you know type methods to actually do in the first place. So um, some examples of this include you know if we want to prove um, uh, you know, a, a theorem, or we want to solve a, um, you know, a system of equations or something like that, of course, we're just doing mathematical operations uh, in, um, over them, and we don't actually need to, you know, make any fuzzy decisions like neural networks have. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, how, like, I, I think you can imagine how mathematical operations would work. If you would like to know a little bit more about how computers solve logic, there's a very interesting uh, book called Representation and Inference for Natural Language uh, by Blackburn and Buzz. And it, it shows you kind of the relatively complicated things that traditional symbolic systems are able to do. Um, in most neural networks, even if they have some sort of multi-hop reasoning, you know, included in them would be very hard pressed to solve, you know, uh, something that requires 10 steps of reasoning, especially over sets or, or things like this. Um, on the other hand, these symbolic systems, the, the big problem is how can you even um, get a reasonable symbolic representation in the first place? Um, what happens when the symbolic systems don't have the rules or the like understanding of interactions between entities that you need in order to solve these problems? So. Um, because of these, you know, they're fragile, they're domain limited, and can't be applicable in many of the situations that we're interested in. Um, so, you know, there's trade-offs between both of them, which kind of uh, makes it reasonable to try to come up with systems that can do both. Another good example of, um, something that neural networks are particularly bad at is um, math. Uh, and to give a specific example of this, um, if you look at whether BERT um, or ELMO or GLOVE or word to vec et cetera, can accurately do a regression from a number's embedding to the number's value. Um, you will find that it's actually not uh, very easy to do. So basically, um, what they did in this experiment here was they they trained 
the uh, the models to see if they could um, uh, predict the value of a number, like regress to the value of a number from each of these representations. And I, I believe the blue part is uh, like the training data or something and the um, orange part is things that were outside of the training data. And you can see that for the training data, it does relatively okay at regressing to the numbers. Um, but if you move outside of the data that was used to train the models, basically they completely fail and can't generalize uh, beyond this distribution. Um, so they don't have, um, you know, an idea of uh, like symbolic map like any standard calculator would have. So um, there's some examples of uh, data sets that explicitly tried to uh, test this. And um, one example is this uh, drop a data set. And uh, so here, this is also a machine reading data set where we have um, untitled 1981, um, sold by Robert Letterman for 16.3 million, well above its 12 million high estimate. And then the question is how many more dollars was untitled 1981 patent being sold for than the $12 million estimation? And in order to get this, you need to do subtraction, like 16.3 million um, and 12. And obviously, a span selection-based model cannot handle this, because the answer is not even a span in the passage. Um, so uh, in order to do this, you need to do both you know, appropriate span selection and uh, symbolic computation. Um, uh, another example is um, comparing uh, you know, the previous and the next uh, time. Uh, and you, you need to know that it, 1517 is before 1518, and then um, you'll be able to get the answer right. If not, you might make a mistake. So there's several um, methods that attempt to solve this problem. Um, I'm just going to give one uh, example here. So basically what this does is it combines the sort of semantic par parsing style approach that I had previously talked about um, with neural networks. So we have um, essentially the question parser will find something like find, filter, find maximum number, uh, re relocate. So who kicked the longest field goal in the second quarter? Um, this find would basically be searching for the word field goal. Um, filter would be searching for the word, the longest field goal. So that would basically, you know, find this, uh, this field goal that qualified as the longest based on its context. Um, and uh, find max num. Uh, okay, sorry, maybe filter and find max num are, uh, would both combine into doing that. And then relocate would be relocating from that particular field goal to the person who kicked it. Um, so this is, uh, this is interesting and you can kind of train the model in a weakly supervised fashion like we train, uh, like we talked about training semantic parsers uh, before. So um, you train the model to try to discover the program that will give you the highest probability of getting, um, getting the correct answer. Um, so finally, um, there's expansions of these models to uh, basically hand expansions of um, neural models to directly handle logical computation. I haven't seen models like this be widely used in um, in NLP, but I think it would be really interesting if they if they were. Um, so basically, as I mentioned before. Um, symbolic reasoning systems that explicitly do kind of predicate logic, like um, uh, finding all all people dying implies this, and uh, and then this is false, and then you have a truth value, and then you have a false value, etc. And what this work does is it basically creates a differentiable uh, solver for these theorem-proving models. And the goal that 
this aims to fix is the fact that these like kind of predicate logic solvers are too brittle and um, cannot handle well the um, the cases where uh, you know there's some sort of uncertainty or um, or things like this in the knowledge base or like for ex an example is um, uh, if you are a professor of computer science, um, if you are, or sorry, a graduate student in computer science, can you program C++ well? And the answer is yes, most of the time, um, but sometimes that might not be the case. So instead of having these kind of true, like hard implication values, um, you can, uh, you can soften them, you can differentiate through so that you get the final answer that, um, that you want. And this is a very elegant method, but it's also kind of complicated. So I won't go into the details here, but I think this is, uh, this is an interesting, you know, maybe complement to uh, the models that are being used to solve these kind of symbolic reasoning tasks and um, uh, might be uh, an interesting thing to think about as well. Um, okay, so uh, I guess that's about all I have for today. I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Oh, so I had a question about the, um, uh, there's no class on April 16th due to the spring carnival, um, but now since the spring carnival is not happening, um, what lecture is being held in place? Um, I don't actually have a plan for doing a lecture then because I wasn't planning on doing a lecture then and I, I don't have content planned. And actually, I, I don't know if I'll be, um, uh, I might be on a break that week. So um, I think uh, I, basically Thursday will be uh, time off. Uh, I can give you time to work on your projects and, uh, and post your presentations and stuff. Um, So, okay, let's see. Um, has there been work on combining language models with like BERT with symbolic reasoning? Um, so I, I think this is one example, of course, like as I mentioned before, um, learning, most machine reading models nowadays use some sort of uh, language model like BERT. Um, the, uh, so th this, has a BERT based model underneath in both the question parser and kind of the program executor parts. Uh, so this would be one example of it. Um, the, uh, another example would be uh, the thing that Hiro talked about last time, uh, where we have, it's not exactly a symbolic reasoning model, but it's um, uh, the multi hop uh, virtual knowledge base. Um, uh, that Buan uh, Dingra here at CMU did. And so that in a way is, it's kind of like symbolic reasoning in that it's, you know, following um, multiple hops and stuff like this. But I, I think there's a lot of work that could be done in this direction. This is just kind of the, the start in that direction. Um, so another question was on the number side, I thought the CARES CNN could do translation from words to values. Um, sorry, I missed, I got the wrong place. Yeah, so here, character CNN can to some extent, um, character LSTM uh, can to some extent as well. Um, I think the bigger problem is that this doesn't generalize. Uh, beyond the the values that it has seen at training time, um, and because of that, you know, any calculator can gener generalize, right? So um, uh, you you don't have your calculator trained on only things from minus five hundred to five hundred, and have it uh, only be able to solve things from minus five hundred to five hundred. So I think the important part is symbolic math is something that we should be able to do well. Um, but neural networks cannot do well because they can't generalize beyond their training distribution. Um, these are good questions. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, 
Um, is each number a unique token? Like um, one minus 100, 100 are all unique tokens. In this particular, um, in this particular experiment here, um, I, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to remember this. This is not my paper, so I, I don't exactly remember the details. But I'm pretty certain that these word to vec, um, these word to vec embeddings essentially will be um, uh, one token per number. Glove will also be one token per number, or one embedding per number. Things like Elmo and Bert um, are contextualized representations. So, you know, you might have to calculate them in context. Um, for character CNN and character LSTM, um, uh, th this is just run over the characters. So this would be the same for each. Uh, for each. Anything else? Okay. Um, if not, I, I think I will finish up. So uh, thanks everyone, very much, everyone. And we will be doing uh, an overview of text generation models uh, on Tuesday. Thank you.